Okay, chapter 24 is about end-of-life care. Um, when you're dealing with working with healthcare, residents are going to be dealing with death and dying. Most people in the nursing facilities are there because they're living, not because they're going to die. A lot of people in rehab are just there short term, they're going to get better, and they're going to go home. So they come to live at the facility, so don't think of everyone as there, oh, they're just there waiting until they die. They're there to live out their life and have an enjoyable, good quality of life, and how you treat them helps provide for their quality of life. But you are going to have some older residents, and more than likely, they're going to be dying sooner than some of the younger, healthier people. Um, so we do have to deal with dying. Your feelings about dying are affected by your life experiences, by your spiritual beliefs, your cultural backgrounds. So all of these reasons are different for every resident as well. And just because we don't believe what every resident believes or another resident believes doesn't make it any different. Um, if a resident wants to talk about dying, wants to talk about a loved one that's dying, you are supposed to be a good listener. You listen to what they have to say, and that is always the correct answer. You don't have to know the correct thing to say to them. You don't have to be a counselor for them and give them your opinion. You just need to be a good listener. Encourage them to talk about how they feel, how they're responding to the dying situation, their common beliefs about things. Some common beliefs about dying is that a lot of people think that life after death is without pain or without hardship. Some people have accepted death and they're fine with dying and passing away. Some people feel like they're going to be reunited with a loved one once they've passed away. Um, some people feel like they're going to be reincarnated and come back into another body or into another form. So always support the person because you don't know what they believe, but just listen to their beliefs. Common fears about dying. Some people think that dying is going to be painful. Some people fear that they're going to die alone. So if your resident tells you, oh, could you just stay with me because I know I'm dying, let them know that you're going to spend as much time as you can with them. You're going to check on them frequently. You'll be back. And just keep reassuring them that you're going to spend extra time with them. But you can't spend 24-7 in their room with just that one person. Um, if they have signs of death and dying, we're going to talk about those. Make sure you let your nurse know as soon as possible. We start making arrangements. The nurse will call the family. We'll bring them in for a conference. The physicians will come in and speak with them. There are certain things that when we know people are dying. And then sometimes death just happens suddenly and we have no idea it was happening. But if someone wants to speak with you, just be a good listener and be reassuring for them. Some people think it's going to be painful when they die. Um, some people have fears related to how they live. They think they didn't live a good enough life and they still need to do some things before they die. They have some unfinished business. They don't feel good about how they live their lives. So they want to confess to everybody and everyone can visit them. So just help them with their fears and let them know that, that you're there to listen to, to them. Some people feel like they haven't achieved all they want to achieve yet in life. Some people feel guilty about what they did or didn't do. If they want to talk about it, let them talk about it. But the process of life is very important. Be open, be non-judgmental, and make sure you're listening. Um, hopefully, everyone has an advanced directive. The advanced directive is your legal document that can that communicates to us or the residents' wishes about their life-saving care on their death. Um, so do they want us to do CPR on them or do they want to be a DNR? So it's usually written when they're mentally competent and if it's not, it's written with the two physicians and a family member. But before you become incapacitated, you need to think about writing an advanced directive to let people know your wishes when it comes to that time in your life. Some people who want to be a DNR, the families do not agree with it at all. But if they were mentally competent when they signed their DNR, we need to follow by their wishes. If you don't agree with their DNR personally as their caregiver, you still need to follow by their wishes because it's their right to die with dignity in the way that they want to die. Okay. 
Okay. It can be revoked at any time by giving verbal notice or simply tearing up the document, but the resident patient has to do that themselves. Okay. Advanced directives incorporate a bunch of different things now, and in Georgia, there's been some new laws, and there's an actual online website that you can go on to print off an advanced directive. It's like 13 pages long, and you just fill in the blanks and check the boxes, and that makes it a legal document. You don't have to go through a lawyer or anything to do that. Have the person do it. Have two witnesses that are not related to the person and have no financial gain from their death and aren't a part of their will um, sign this advanced directive for them. So if you're not their caregiver, you can't sign it as their caregiver either. But they need two unbiased witnesses. Um, a living will can be part of the advanced directives. This living will states their wishes about withdrawing or withholding their life-sustaining procedures so that when they're terminally ill, do they want to be on a ventilator? Do they want to have CPR? Do they want to have medications? What kind of things do they want? Do they want to have a trach put in them? Do they need IV hydration? If they stop being able to eat, do they want enteral nutrition or a G-tube placed in them? All of those things are part of their living will with their quality of care and their medical decisions that they want made to keep them alive. Their medical durable power of attorney is part of their advanced directives. This is the patient is going to designate someone, usually a family member, who is going to help them make healthcare decisions when they become incapacitated. This is when the family gets to decide what happens to that person if they feel like they, but they need to be following the patient's wishes if they know what those wishes are. Um, but then if they just don't want to make their wishes known and just let the family decide, they'll uh, designate that durable power of attorney to help them. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is a psychiatrist who came up with these five stages of dying and grief. You do need to know the five stages, but just know that people may go back and forth among the five stages. They don't always go in this order, but this is generally the order that they go in, but they do can go back and forth between the stages. But usually when someone is told that they are dying or have a terminal illness, the first response is denial. Your first reaction is, no, that can't be me. I don't have cancer. The scans have to be wrong. Nobody wants to accept the fact that they're dying or that they have a terminal illness that's not going to get better. Um, dementia is a thing. You know, you get a diagnosis of dementia and you know that is a terminal illness. You're not going to recover from Alzheimer's. You're eventually going to pass away from something. Um, anger could be the next step. You're going to start asking, why is this happening to me? I'm a good person. Well, I've done everything right. I'm a good person. I don't do anything wrong. Why is this happening to me? Um, bargaining is the next step. You're going to start saying, well, if I start eating better and losing weight and exercising every day, then this cancer is going to go away. Or if your child is dying and you're angry and in denial from that, then you're going to start saying, oh, take me instead of him. So some bargaining goes on with the acceptance of a dying terminal illness state. Um, at some point, there's going to be some depression. You're going to start feeling down and upset about it. I mean, it's just a natural response that happens. Nobody wants to die. So you're going to start thinking, getting a little bit depressed about it. And then the last stage is hopefully going to be acceptance. At some point, you're going to finally accept the fact that you're dying, get your ducks in order, get everything straightened out, um, talk to everyone you need to. Sometimes family members wait and wait and wait, or patients just hang on until that last family member comes to visit them. And then they talk with that last family member and then resolve their issues, and then they pass away shortly after. So, but these five stages of dying and grief. Know that they happen. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Families go through these exact same stages. They go through them in different orders, but at some point in the death and dying process, everybody is going through these stages. And it's normal. Okay? Almost everyone who is terminally ill and knows that their death is inevitable will have these problems. I'm not going to get better. Be supportive for them, but don't give them false hope. Listen to them and let them express their feelings. 
For your end-of-life care, we're focusing on care that meets the individual's needs according to their advanced directives. Again, if they want to be a DNR or do not resuscitate, we have to abide by that. Even if you don't agree with it, don't start CPR on them. They'll have some designation or mark on the outside of their chart usually. They'll have it on your care plan, on your activity sheet, or your CNA assignment sheet. You should know who is a DNR, but check that every day because it could change. You need to ask your nurse before you start CPR if you know someone is a DNR. Make sure everyone is treated with dignity, their choices are honored, their symptoms are relieved. If they're complaining of pain, we let the nurse know so we can give them more pain medicine. And we're providing them emotional and spiritual support. If they want to speak to the chaplain, if they ask you to pray with them, get the chaplain for them. You can't tell them that you're going to call the chaplain or you can't call the chaplain without them requesting it. But if they ask you, you're going to help them meet their spiritual needs. If they want to go to activities at the facility that have to deal with church, you're going to get them to those activities at the right time. Um, if they need to have their last rites read to them, that's a Catholic thing. They have to have their own priest for that, but family members know that. The family need, members need to know ahead of time. If we feel like their death is coming soon, maybe sooner than later, we let the families know so that they can make arrangements with the priest to have them come and read their last rites. A lot of people who have terminal illness are put on hospice care. So we talked about the difference between hospice care and respite care. But hospice care is this program for specially trained interdisciplinary team members that are helping people with the death and dying process that we know are terminally ill. These residents are expected to die within six months, but just because they don't pass away in six months doesn't mean that they're better. They just come off hospice for a little while, and then when they get sick again or closer towards that dying end stages, then we will call hospice back. Hospice provides nursing care, CNA care, um, chaplain care. It just gives an extra bit of comfort for people. There's a social worker involved. There's another doctor involved. There's more medication involved for their comfort. So we, we offer hospice as part of a comfort care plan. It's paid for by Medicare. So the social worker helps people with their arrangements to get these extra help in. We're observing for the signs and symptoms of death, decreased bodily functioning, and providing support to the families and residents. Um, remember that these residents are DNR, so if something happens to them, we don't do CPR, but we call the hospice company and the hospice nurse comes in and it's dealt with in a dignified manner through hospice. They're providing comfort measures. Make sure you keep your room well lighted and well ventilated during the day and make sure you have the lights off at night. Even if your person is comatose, they're not dead yet, hearing is the last sense to go, and you're gonna make sure they still have a daytime and a nighttime they're comfortably turned every two hours, they're changed, they're clean, they're dry, they're dignified, okay? Identify yourself every time you go into the room, make sure that the person knows that you're there. So hearing is the lessons to go, don't talk about them while they're dying because they can still hear you. Change their position every two hours, change their clothing, change their bedding. They may be sweating a lot, they may be incontinent, but you don't want their family members to come in and see them in the bed covered in sweat and urine and stool. You know, they need to be cleaned frequently. They need to have frequent mouth care. We talked about this in the mouth care chapter. Turn them on their side so that they don't aspirate on the water and turn them on their side and sponge out their mouth with the little spongies every two hours. Okay, but don't let them aspirate and choke on the water that you have on that sponge. Keep them well groomed, keep their skin in good condition, keep them changed, keep them dry. Um, do frequent mouth and lip care. Check their vital signs if that's part of the doctor's orders. If you have abnormal vital signs, report them to the nurse immediately. Spend extra time with the residents. Talk to them, listen to them, help the family members deal with their feelings and deal with their stress. Listen to what the family members have to say. Families are going through all of these same emotions. Um, don't take anything personally, no criticism, no anger. 
all of that is geared towards the disease process, not towards you. Okay, be sure you're listening. Um, cultural practices, if the family wants to put oils on them or bathe them with something or leave trinkets on their bed or leave rosaries or anything they want to do, the families are allowed to do as part of their cultural practices. They're allowed to have symbols in their room. Even if the roommate doesn't like it, maybe we can move the roommate to another room. We'll have to put that in as a grievance and then go through the social work process to maybe move the roommate out of the room. But while that person is dying, we're always being respectful of their cultural preferences. And again, if they need to speak to the chaplain, if they need to have a rabbi or a priest or they have special people come in and pray with them, that's all allowed in the facility. Okay? If you feel comfortable praying with them, if they initiate the conversation and ask you to pray with them and you feel comfortable with that, you can do that. Reassure the family members that the body is going to be treated with dignity and respect. The families want to make sure that they're covered all the time, or that they have oils on them. If they have something that they leave with you, the incense they want to burn, as long as it's not an open flame, but if you want to put some um, essential oils on them, then they can do that. Okay. Other residents are going to want to talk about the resident that's dying. You have to follow the HIPAA policies. You have to maintain confidentiality. You can't tell everybody in the whole facility why the person's dying. But you can encourage patients to talk about their own feelings about death, encourage them to talk about their sadness, and be a good listener. Okay. Reminisce about the person who died after the person's passed away. The nurse, the funeral home is going to come or the ambulance is going to come, but usually at the funeral home, they bring a stretcher and they bring a quilt. We're going to make sure that the other residents are out of the hallway, maybe put them in the dining room, put them in an activity, just make sure the hallway is kind of cleared, cover the, um, the patient on the stretcher, they bring a nice quilt with them, and then wheel them down out the back door into the hearse or into the ambulance. So it's not a big spectacle when you're wheeling some dead person down in the hallway and everybody's gawking and looking at them. Okay, It's a private thing. Maybe the family wants to be there. Maybe they don't. But we have contacted the family to come and then they then we contact the funeral home and everything gets taken care of in with dignity, with confidentiality, without violating their rights. Okay, Managing your own feelings. It's all right for you to be upset. Especially if you were close to the resident, you're going to feel sadness, you're going to feel grief, you're going to feel anger. You're going to have these same feelings and emotions as well. If you need a counselor, they offer that with every facility that you work at. You can talk to the chaplain yourself. You can talk to other staff members. It's a good time to cry and, and let it all out. Okay? Don't hold it in. You can go to the funeral if you want to. You can go to the viewing if you want to. Um, you were part of their family as well. So, Signs of approaching death. These are things that if you walk into a room and you see, you're going to come report it to the nurse immediately. The skin becomes mottled, pale, and gray. So mottled is like this splotchy looking um, when they're losing circulation and it starts getting all purpley and gray and splotchy and dull looking. Um, their eyes start to just stare blankly off into space, like they're having a seizure, but they can't move or they can't hear you or they're not looking at you. Um, and then their breathing is going to become irregular and shallow and rapid. So sometimes that's called Cheyenne Stokes. It's a rapid, shallow breathing. They breathe really fast in little short, puffy, puffy breaths, and then they slow down, and then they stop breathing for a few minutes for apnea, a few seconds with apnea and then they take a deep, slow, heavy sigh and then breathe shallow and quick again. They're breathing like 30 or 40 times a minute. You need to let the nurse know immediately. Okay. We do give them medication. Their morphine and their adipan helps with their pain. It helps with their respirations. It helps with their breathing problems when they're passing away. Heavy perspiration is common, which means they're going to be sweating a lot. The bed's going to be covered like night sweats all over. It's going to be wet. Um, loss of muscle tone. Their body is going to become limp. Their jaw is going to drop down. Their mouth is going to stay partially open. They're going to start having this death rattle. It's like a gurgling sound of saliva in the back of their throat. 
and you know they're not able to clear their throat and they're not able to breathe well. Eventually their pulse is going to become rapid and weak and irregular and you're not going to be able to feel it so well. And then just before death, their respirations and their pulse are going to stop. Do not give them CPR if they are a DNR or a hospice patient. Okay. Your post-mortem care. This is care of the person after they have passed away. CNAs are responsible for helping with post-mortem care. The nurse can come in and help you as well, but it's according to facility policy if you leave all the tubes in them or if you take out their IVs, if you take out their Foley or if you take out their dentures. If every facility's policy is different, but as a CNA, you know you're going to be cleaning the person up, you're going to be changing their briefs because they've become incontinent with their last breath, making them smell good, bathe them up a little bit, change the diaper or the briefs, and then make sure they look presentable for when the families come in to view them for that last time. They're in a comfortable position. They look like they're resting. They don't look like they're disheveled and thrown all over the bed with the sheets off of them and butt naked. They have on decent clothes. They look like they're resting. Okay. Good hand hygiene. Make sure you wear gloves whenever you're handling a dead body. Collect the following um, supplies. There's always a post-mortem kit. It's the box that has everything you need in it with a shroud and a toe tag and some things to clean them with a bed protector, a basin, a denture cup maybe. You have to know where all their belongings are. You have to pack up all their belongings. You have to put all their valuables in an envelope for the family to come get. You have to pack up their dentures, their teeth. Sometimes they go with them to the funeral home. Sometimes they go to the family. It just depends on your facility and what the family wants. Um, raise the bed for a good, comfortable body mechanics for yourself. Make sure the bed is flat because the person has no more muscle tone. They're not going to be able to help you move them around. Um, but make sure that they look like they're comfortable and in good alignment for the family. You're going to give them a partial bed bath. You're going to do mouth care. You're going to change their linen. You're going to pack up all their valuables, all their belongings, and give them to the mortician or the family. And then clean up the room for visiting. So this is going to be a little slideshow uh, video on post-mortem care expectations. Your facility will have a policy for the care of the body after death. In most cases, the nursing assistant delivers post-mortem care. Though some facilities have a morgue to which the body will be transported, most facilities will require that the body be left in the room until picked up by the mortuary. Remember to respect the religious beliefs of the deceased and his or her family. As with any other procedure, perform your beginning procedure actions. Remember that the body can be infectious after death, so apply the principles of standard precautions. Position the resident on his or her back with a pillow underneath the head and shoulders. Always handle the body very gently and treat it with the same respect that you would if the resident were alive. Close the eyes by gently pulling the eyelids down. Provide mouth care using moistened oral care swabs or sponges. If resident has dentures, place cleaned dentures in the mouth or follow your facility policy. If the dentures are not replaced, they should be sent to the funeral home with the body. Close the mouth. A rolled up washcloth may be placed under the chin to keep the jaw closed. Follow facility policy for removal of tubing from the body. In most facilities, the charge nurse will remove the tubing. If the death is considered reportable to your coroner's office, the tubing should not be removed. Bathe the body, straighten the arms and legs, and comb the hair. If necessary, apply clean dressings to wounds. Check with the charge nurse if the dressings are soiled. Since urine and stool may continue to seep out after death, place a bed protector or underpad under the buttocks. Place a gown on the body. 
Position the body to look as natural as possible. Attach identification tags to the body according to facility policy. Replace soiled linen and cover the body to the shoulders with a sheet and bedspread. Remove your gloves and discard according to facility policy. Wash your hands. Straighten the room and remove any unnecessary equipment. Again, wash your hands. Provide privacy and allow family members to be alone with the body. Collect the resident's personal belongings, place them in a bag, and label them correctly. Usually, these items are given to the resident's family. If no family members are present, follow facility policy for the disposition of the decedent's personal belongings. Complete and sign the inventory sheet according to facility policy. If your facility utilizes a shroud, wash your hands after the family leaves and put the shroud on the body. Wear gloves if contact with blood or body fluid is likely. Remove your gloves and discard them according to facility policy. Transfer the body to the morgue or close the door to the resident's room and pull the privacy curtain until the mortician arrives. When the mortician arrives, notify the charge nurse and assist funeral home personnel to move the body if necessary. Strip and clean the unit according to facility policy after the body has been removed. Okay, so sometimes if you're in a hospital, you may be asked to take the body down to the morgue after the family has visited. So you just need to know what your policy is. Um, the deceased body, you're always treating it with respect and you're following any cultural preferences that they need. And then you're cleansing the body of any mucus, urine, stool, feces, but you're always wearing gloves because they're oozing bodily fluid, which could be contaminated. Or, so make sure you're using the proper PPE and washing your hands frequently when you're doing the post-mortem care. And just be respectful. If you need any help, just ask the nurse.